Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, I trust that you are growing in your love and admiration for the Lord Jesus, that you are growing in obedience and surrender to his word, to his will, and to his way each and every day. Well, today we're going to continue our study on the Holy Spirit. We did a first video, and I fell unfortunately short in presenting to you all the truth uh, that I would like to share with you that the Bible has to say for us as followers of the Lord Jesus and how the Spirit is to impact our lives. And so I felt it was important to do a second video so that we could touch on some topics. And again, I'm going to fail miserably short in presenting all the truth of the Holy Spirit, but my intention is to focus upon the most important aspects of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the followers of the Lord Jesus and what we need to look for and examine within ourselves to see if we truly do belong to Him. Because there are many who claim to be His, and yet on that day they will never enter. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, when Jesus the Lord is speaking and he says, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And yet I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The implication here is that they knew the Lord, but the Lord never knew them. And that's what I want to discuss today. What is the true mark of a follower of the Lord Jesus? Now again, being a Bible study, I trust that you have your Bible in front of you because we are going to look at many different passages. But let's begin with, and, and the, the passage we just read, in my opinion, is the most frightening passage in the entire Bible because there are many who think that they're going to enter the, the kingdom. There are many who think that they're born again. There are many who think that they're followers of the Lord Jesus, and yet on that day, they're going to be sadly reminded that this is a relationship, a two-way relationship. It's not religion. It's not about doing certain things and earning God's favor. It's a relationship, a passionate love relationship that we must be involved in. But if that's the most frightening passage in the entire Bible, the second most frightening to me is found in Romans and chapter 8. So if you have your Bible, and I trust that you do, turn to Romans chapter 8, and let's begin with verse 1. Now it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now many people want to stop right there. But if you stop there, you're leaving the passage empty. It continues by saying, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus, and you're walking according to the flesh, certainly there's going to be condemnation from the Holy Spirit to convict you of the sin and the offenses that you're committing before God. But if you're walking in the Spirit, then certainly there is no condemnation because you are clean in the sight of God. Well, Paul continues in verse 2 and he says, The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death or the law of the flesh. For what the law or the flesh could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us as followers of the Lord Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. Now notice this, for to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind or the fleshly mind is enmity against God. It is at war with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh as followers of the Lord Jesus, but you're in the Spirit. If, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now this is the frightening part. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He does not belong to him. He's not in that passionate love relationship, that surrender to his king. And this is important because these are the people who are going to stand before the Lord as we're reminded in Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 and claim to have known him and yet he is going to sadly awaken them to the fact that he never knew them. So let's look at that again. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So it's important that we as followers of the Lord Jesus examine ourselves to see if we have the Spirit of Christ. And the question would be, what is the Spirit of Christ? And so for, in order for us to understand that, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Now it says, if any man be in Christ, or we could say, if any man has the Spirit of Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. It's just like a, 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 a caterpillar that enters into a cocoon and months later comes out a beautiful butterfly. There is an absolute transformation of what that creature looked like. And so it is with us. If you can remember your day of conversion, the day when you were truly born again, if you have been truly born again, you're going to realize that you as the person before that conversion, you were selfish. You were self-centered. Life was all about you and you cared very little for others or the needs of others. Yet in a single moment of time, you were instantly changed and you were no longer self-centered, rebellious, uncaring, but now there was a desire within you to love others, to think less of yourself, and to have a spirit of surrender and forgiveness. If you have the spirit of Christ, you are a new creation. There has been a radical change. The old things are dead. They're passed away, and all things about you have become new. That's what Ezekiel means when he tells us in chapter 36, verse 26, God the Father is speaking and says, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. You could almost say a new desire. What you once loved, you now hate, and what you once hated, you now love. So he says, a new heart I will give you. I'm not going to change your heart. I'm going to exchange your heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away that stony, selfish, rebellious heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh, a heart of tenderness, a heart of compassion and gentleness. And I will put my spirit within you, says the Almighty. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes, in my laws, in my judgments, and you will do them. You will desire to do them. You won't just strive to do them with great effort, but there will be a new desire within you that causes you to want to do them, 
causes you to want to surrender to my law, to my will, and to my way. This is what Jesus meant when he spoke in Matthew chapter 15, and he begins by quoting from, I believe it's Isaiah, he says, this people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why? Because their heart hasn't been changed. They're doing all the right things religiously, but there's not that passionate love relationship that abides within their heart. He continues in verse 9 and he says, In vain they worship me, and they teach doctrines and commandments of men. But now look at verse 11. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man. That's what we focus on. We, we focus on the external things, and that's where we put all of our effort. But all of that is in vain if our heart has not been changed. And so Jesus finishes by saying, it is that which comes out of the mouth that defiles a man. Why? Because it's what comes out of the mouth that comes from the heart. That's an evidence of the spirit that is within us. And if there's a defiling, rebellious spirit within us, then our heart has not been changed and we do not belong to him. This is why many times you will see people who live a religious life and it seems like they're doing all the things that religion requires, but they're mean-spirited. They're bitter. There's no joy there. There's no love. There's no compassion for others. They do not have the spirit of Christ within them. And if this is you, my friend, I would encourage you to go before the Lord in surrender and plead with him to change your heart so that you can become a radical, born again, on fire for Jesus, in love with the Father, Holy Spirit possessed follower of the Lord Jesus, and you will become that new creation that the Bible tells us of where old things have passed away, old things are now dead, and you are a new radical creation in the Lord Jesus. You see, we're told in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. It is a trait of Lucifer, Satan himself. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Why? Because rebellion and stubbornness is the, is the very opposite of surrender. That's why when Jesus speaks in Matthew chapter 18, and he's teaching about church discipline, he says in verse 15 of, of Matthew 18, if your brother will trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. If he hears thee, if he surrenders, you've gained your brother. But if he does not hear thee, or he does not surrender, then take with you two or more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, and he still continues to be rebellious and stubborn, take it unto the church. If he neglects to hear the church, let him be treated as a publican and a heathen. Why? Because his actions have exposed his heart, and his heart is not one of surrender, but it's one of rebellion. It's one of stubbornness. You see, it's the spirit of surrender that marks a true follower of the Lord Jesus. Both surrender to God and his will and to his word and surrender to others. And so when they rebuke us, we don't become proud. We don't become rebellious and defiant, but we truly examine what they say with a heart of tenderness to see if there's something they see in us that we don't see about ourselves. And maybe they're speaking the truth. Now, I say all of this because our focus is upon the spirit of the Lord Jesus. And in, in Galatians, as we looked at last time, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23, actually verse 22, this is what it says. The fruit of the spirit, or let us say the fruit of the life of the Lord Jesus that we see given to us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the first couple of chapters of the book of Acts, the spirit that we see in Jesus is love. 
And this is what we should see in ourselves, a desire to truly love others, not a worldly love, but a godly love, a love that loves those who others would consider to be our enemies, those who are attacking us, those who are hurting us and harming us. Yet we respond with love the same way Jesus did. The fruit of Jesus, the fruit of the spirit that, that thrived within Jesus and that should be within us is love. It's joy. It's peace. It's long suffering or patience. It's gentleness. And, and let me go back and, and talk about peace for just a moment. When we talk about peace, when the whole world is frantic, like it was at 9-11, yet we, as the followers of the Lord Jesus, know that he is in perfect control and therefore we are at peace. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, says the, the psalmist. And so the fruit that we're looking for in us to be alive within us, a desire, a new desire that God has given us is to love, is to be joyous, is to be at peace, is to be long-suffering, or like I said, patient. It's to be gentle and kind to others. It's to be full of goodness and faith. It's to be meek. By meek, we almost mean timid, or you could say humble. And it's to be temperate. That's a, that's a word for self-control. We operate within self-control. And against such, there is no law. For they that belong to Jesus Christ and possess his spirit have crucified the flesh and are continually crucifying the flesh with all of its affections and all of its lusts. If we, as the followers of the Lord Jesus, live and walk and are alive in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit, or let us walk as Jesus walked, which is what we're told in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And so what I want you to see is unlike what the modern church tells us, that the fruit of the Spirit or the indication of the Spirit in our lives is based upon some outward manifestation, some ecstatic utterances, some great work of, of external power. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are to focus what's going on inside, our feelings, our attitudes, our desires, our goals, our wants. And if any of these point to self, then they're wrong, they're evil, they're straight from the heart of the enemy. But if they're about love for God and love for others and self-sacrifice to ourselves, self-denial to ourselves, then friends, we are exhibiting the life of the Lord Jesus and we are walking not according to the flesh, but we are walking according to the spirit. And so let me end today by, and again, I know that there are many things that I've left out, but I want to focus upon the most important details of the spirit of the Lord Jesus who is alive or should be alive within those who claim to follow him. And so let me end by reading to you from the Message Bible, Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16, and we'll just read down to the end. He says in what we just read, but in a more modern way of putting things, in Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 16, he says, my counsel is this. Now, this is Paul speaking. And he says, my counsel is this to you. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. They are at war with one another. These two ways of life are antithetical, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose instead to be led by the Spirit 
and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence or a flesh-dominated existence. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied once, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives or fruit of his spirit evidence of his character within us he brings into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard things like affection for others exuberance about life serenity we develop a willingness to stick with things a sense of compassion in the heart and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, and we are able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. You see, legalism or religion, the attempt to do good and follow what we believe to be the law of God without the desire first to be there, that is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good. It is crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but let us instead work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives because each of us is an original. And so again, as Paul told us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, you as a follower of Jesus are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit if it so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Because if any man has not the spirit of Christ, has not the character of Christ, has not the quality of Christ, in him, he is none of his. He does not belong to him. So friends, let our focus not be upon the things that are external, but instead let our focus be upon the things that are internal. Let us examine our feelings, our attitudes, our thoughts, our desires. And if they do not exhibit the person of the Lord Jesus let us fall on our faces before the Almighty, plead for forgiveness, and ask that he would make us a new creation where old things have passed away, hallelujah, and all things have become new, where we no longer walk according to the flesh and the desires of this world, but we now walk according to the Spirit, where our eyes are no longer open to the things of this world and all that it offers us, 
But all of our attention, all of our focus, all of our dedication is set upon the kingdom. And as Jesus told us, we seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these other external things will take care of themselves. Well, I love you, friends. I'm so grateful again that you chose to spend a few moments with us. And I pray that the word of the Lord is changing your life. You see, we are to be growing in faith and obedience unto the Lord Jesus. And the power is in the word. The power is not in the messenger. The power is not in the message, so to speak. The power is in the word of the living God. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I trust that as you read and study your Bibles each day and you come to videos like this and you learn about the word of God, I pray that it is having a transforming effect on your life and that you are becoming a more loyal and faithful follower of the Lord Jesus each and every day, growing in the spirit and denying the flesh. Well, now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.